So it looks like it's 11 o'clock. Um, we usually are pretty good about starting on time. Um, so I can uh, go ahead and start introducing Dr. Sears. Um, so I want to say thank you everybody for joining our CIEHS Farm Talk seminar, uh, seminar series today. Uh, my name is Tyler Gripsover and today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lonnie Sears. Um, <clears throat> so Dr. Sears is a pediatric psychologist and professor of pediatrics at the University of Louisville and Norton Children's uh, Medical Group. He received his PhD in neuroscience and psychology at Indiana U University and completed a postdoc at the University of Iowa Department of Psychiatry Mental Health Clinical Research Center. Um, in addition to clinical work in developmental disabilities, um, he has also been involved in research on causes and treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. He is currently a site PI for NIHS funded study coal ash and neurobehavioral symptoms in children aged 6 to 14 years. So uh, today the title of his presentation is Neurobehavioral Health in Children Living Near Coal Power Plants. And so with, that, uh, so with that, Dr. Sears, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Tyler, for that introduction. And I'll see if we can get things set up here. Are you able to see that? Yep. Well, I've positioned my uh, laptop so you can see the snow out the uh, out of the window. So hopefully, have a scenic backdrop for my uh, talk in addition to the slides. And uh, as mentioned, um, my background is in developmental uh, disabilities, and uh, and I've been at, at University of Louisville for about almost uh, thirty years now. And most of the work has involved looking at uh, causes and treatment of uh, developmental disabilities and uh, uh, clinical work, a lot of work doing evaluations with families. And um, I really haven't had uh, a lot of exposure to environmental exposure, so to speak, until more recently getting involved in this coal ash uh, uh, study. And uh, so I'm, I'm new to the field, so to speak, and uh, my expertise might be stretched a little bit in some of the chemistry or topics I'll discuss, so I appreciate your uh, indulgence as I uh, go through the study. Um, <clears throat> just first, I'll do a little background on coal ash and uh, why it might be of interest for, for uh, study. And then I'm going to talk about the methods of our study, uh, looking at coal ash and uh, exposure in children and neurobehavioral effects. And it's been going for about five years or a little over five years now. And, uh, and then uh, talk about our findings, uh, work that we've published and is under review. And just to give some idea of initial findings on, on uh, neurobehavioral health in, in children in this area. So this is the Cane Run Power Plant and it's in Southwest uh, Jefferson County. And we looked in the area of two power plants, there's uh, Cane Run and then Mill Creek. And the arrows indicate uh, coal ash ponds, which are areas where the uh, uh, coal combustion residuals are stored. And, um, you know, sometimes people see the smoke coming out of the stacks and think that's the concern. But uh, there's also a lot of concern regarding the, the coal ash storage sites uh, near the the, uh, the plant. And um, the coal ash can uh, contain fly ash, which is kind of the, the a central uh, topic for this presentation. There's also other uh, materials, uh, bottom ash, boiler slag, uh, flue gas, desulfurization, and, and jimson are also part of that. And this is a picture um, from Cane Run. And one advantage that uh, led to this study was that you could see the, the pollution. I think it's helpful to uh, have uh, community concern because they can see the dust on their car or the windows. So, you know, again, it was really a community initiated study in the sense that, uh, you know, people were saying, you know, we have this dust all over, it's causing problems. And uh, it was relatively easy to get the community engaged because it's a real visible uh, concern from the dust. And uh, thankfully, they've uh, they have covered uh, cane run, so I think the dust is diminished in, in that area. The the coal ash storage sites have been covered, so there's been some progress with with uh, reducing the dust. 
And within that coal ash, as I mentioned, is fly ash. And to identify fly ash, um, uh, you use a, a microscope looking at, um, you can see on the, the slide there, the circular or spherical shapes. And uh, you can see the diameter, it tends to be uh, uh, within the PM10 or some, some ultrafine particles. Uh, and it's made from the coal combustion process. It gets a spherical shape from that. And, uh, and it has silica, aluminum, iron, and calcium as primary components. Uh, the other more significant issue is that it also contains ne uh, known neurotoxins like arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium, chromium, and selenium. And uh, those are the topics of, of concern or areas of concern for looking at health effects and often cited is uh, risk from coal ash due to the, the uh, heavy metals that that are uh, in coal ash. And one question is, uh, how how far does the fly ash travel? You know, the, the fly ash can enter uh, the environment through uh, leaching through the storage sites, through the water supply. Uh, so there's uh, ways that it enters the environment that way. Uh, you know, again, we've been looking at the fugitive fly ash, and this is a study from a group of researchers at Duke looking at coal ash. And um, they, in the uh, figure there, the Marshall Steam Station is where the coal ash storage site is. And you know, this is helpful to kind of get the picture. They've sampled around the area, and this is oh, about within 10 kilometers of the plant. And you can see the different sites that are, are noted that uh, in uh, the uh, orange color. Those are sites that uh, had fly ash identified in the soil sample. So that, you know, again, there's area of dispersion that includes a distance that um, that we used. So it disperses from those coal ash storage sites. The other issue is, is that uh, they did soil samples and they find that the the uh, fly ash enrich, uh, they use the term enrichment factor, but uh, compared to soil without fly ash, uh, they have the various uh, metals and elements there. And you can see that there's an increase in the concentration up to you know, around 10 times uh, and more for some um, in terms of increasing the concentration of fly ash. So burning coal increases the concentration and as it gets into the soil, uh, it also increases. And some of these levels are above EPA uh, safe levels. Uh, so the soil in those areas that were identified have high levels of these elements and some would be considered uh, unsafe levels in that area. And again, presumably that's also occurs in our, our area. <clears throat> and why look at behavioral effects of coal ash? Uh, coal ash storage sites in the US are noted uh, in that in the, the figure. Uh, you can see they're spread across the country. Uh, 70, uh, the coal ash is going down in terms of production and recently it was 79 million tons of coal ash. And there is some good uh, to the story. Uh, coal ash can be recycled and used for like uh, Jimson board. It's used in concrete. So there is some recycling that is done. Um, but there is a lot of coal ash gentry in the environment at these various storage sites. And it estimated that 1.5 million children live near these storage sites in the US. Now, uh, it's kind of complicated to figure out well, at least for me, what the how EPA considers uh, coal ash to be uh, non-hazardous, but it is classified as that. And currently, uh, I think most of the monitoring of of coal ash is done the, through the state level, um, so it's considered non-hazardous. But EPA does note that there are toxins that that raise concern for health effects. And there's really no studies of you know. Again, I'm, I'm uh, my talk focuses on the behavioral effects, so. Uh, you know, there's other issues um, with other health considerations, but, you know, just looking at the behavior, there's really no studies looking at um, behavioral effects of, of children living near these coal ash storage sites. There is a, a, a study that uh, by uh, our research team that looked at um, children near the coal ash site compared to children similar demographics away from coal storage and the children near coal ash had higher reports of ADHD, sleep, GI, and respiratory problems. So those were some of the concerns that were, were noted in that survey, and that led it led into the larger study that uh, we wanted to look at in more detail uh, possible health effects on behavior. So what we did was recruit 
within 10 miles midpoint between the power plants. And uh, this is uh, work of Charlie Zhang, who's in uh, geosciences here at U of L, and and uh, I'll have some other information from him. He's really contributed a lot in terms of of the study. And so what was done, um, Carol Hanschett uh, prior to Charlie, and then and then Charlie have been our uh, specialist in the geosciences and spatial mapping. And so this is the area where we recruited from. And uh, you can see Cane Run and, and Mill Creek uh, uh, sites there. And, and we used a, a midpoint 10 miles um, uh, radius. And uh, again, in, if you look at that previous study on dispersion, it, it would include, uh, you would expect it to have, have uh, fly ash at all all this area, coal ash combustion residuals. At this, uh, in the, within this radius. And in fact, we did find fly ash in the home within the studies that we, uh, within the homes that we studied within this uh, 10 mile uh, radius. Also, I'll get a little ahead of myself, but just note uh, one thing that Charlie was able to do was uh, spatial mapping, looking for hot spots. And so these, uh, the dots there represent the, the homes that we sampled uh, air from, uh, indoor air. And you can see in, in red the hot spots. So those are areas where there are high levels of PM10. And you can look at the relationship of the uh, PM10 in the home to the, the uh, uh, power plants, especially around Mill Creek. And you know, during our study at Cane Run, um, they covered, they, they worked on uh, covering the storage sites. So you know, one possibility is that Cane Run has less of those hot spots near it because they were in the process of, of closing the, the uh, storage site. So we're looking into that kind of as the storage site closed, is there changes in the fly ash? Uh, but you can see that uh, being close to the power plant seems to increase your PM10 that's in your home. So what we did then with, from that recruitment area was sent uh, flyers to homes and we also did some foot recruiting and put up uh, flyers. And you know, basically similar to this, uh, who can participate? You know, children were six to 14 years of age living near the power plants, and if, if you received this flyer, and then they were asked to allow uh, air pollution sampling in your home. Uh, you're going to do computer and manual tests uh, with a psychologist, myself, and then we're going to collect your child's fingernails and toenails and fill out questionnaires. And you don't need to come to U of L was the good news because we did everything in their home. And then for participating, they, they had a gift card for the parent and and for the child uh, for uh, their participation. So after consenting and agreement to participate, <clears throat> we uh, put these uh, filters uh, with pumps inside the home for one week, and it was put in the area where the child spent most of their time. And from the filters, we could get a, uh, a measure of PM10, and we got the presence of fly ash and again using the scanning electron microscopy uh, looked at the uh, filters and and we if those spherical shapes were identified we counted it as yes i didn't not we but the lab did that and so that was you know fly ash presence yes or no and then uh, the filters and the toenails as well were sent to uh, a lab in lexington for PIXI, proton induced X-ray emission analysis, and that's able to identify 72 elements in, within the filter. So we had measures from the filter. We also uh, obtained 150 milligrams of finger and toenails from children, and this was probably the longest uh, uh, task. It take a month or so, kind of depending on if the child was a nail biter or how fast the fingernails grew. And uh, toenails um, are thought to uh, to reflect exposure over the past six to 12 months. You know, apparently blood flows uh, to the toenails and the metals bind to uh, keratin in the nails as they grow. Uh, we can take them and then get that exposure measure. And as I said, then um, if you want to know more about Pixie, I'd Google that elemental analysis in Lexington and they have a nice um, website with discussion of Pixie and, and information on uh, the elements and level of detection. So uh, we went in and set up the monitors. We uh, got we started toenail collecting. Then we had parents complete a lot of surveys. We had them fill out an environmental health questionnaire, which basically goes through the history 
of the family and asks about exposures. You know, if you live in a home 478 or any known lead exposures or um, uh, any other uh, things that may relate to environmental exposures affecting behavior. There's a home cleaning questionnaire, so we wanted to know, um, you know, if you used a, a HEPA filter in your vacuum or were your windows open and how often did you clean and uh, uh, get that information to analyze uh, possible differences in environmental exposure in the home. We looked at a pediatric health history, so we uh, had a nurse visit the uh, child in the home and did uh, um, height, weight, blood pressure, collected a health history um, and uh, uh, got information on possible um, issues within the home in terms of exposures. And then uh, for my part, uh, I had the parents complete this, that was called the child behavior checklist. And that's the front page of the form on the right. And uh, basically it has uh, questions asking about the child's uh, uh, behavior that's observed by the parent. And <clears throat> from the rating scale, uh, you know, there's probably 100 and about 120 questions. Uh, you get these uh, ratings for problem areas, uh, anxious, depressed, with Don depressed, uh, etc. Uh, through that list, I just wanted to call attention to two two uh, problem areas that I'll be discussing in terms of the results. One is uh, rule breaking behavior, and the other is depressive problems. So those are, you know, again, it's it's grouping child behavior into uh, separate categories based on types of behavior problems. And again, this is, is based on factor analysis and research studies. So there is some sense that these categories hold together and, and are related to child behavior problems. And just some examples. So for depressive problems, the parent would fill out um, for the child questions like, uh, child enjoys little, harms self, feels worthless, is tired a lot or sleeps more, uh, sleep problems, sad, cries a lot, doesn't eat well, feels guilty, uh, thinks about suicide, lacks energy. And again, this is for ages six on up. Uh, our group is six to 14. And so, you know, these depressive problems are going to differ by age, but uh, they norm it according to age and gender. So we can get a measure of uh, depressive features in, in kids across this age span. Again, from these questions, and the parent responds uh, not at all or a little bit or quite a bit. So we get scores from zero, one, and two. <clears throat> Excuse me, an example from rule breaking behavior. A uh, child drinks alcohol, breaks rules, lies and cheats, runs away, sex problems, steals, thinks about sex, truant vandalism, uh, lacks feelings of guilt, has bad friends, prefers older kids, sets fires. You know, so basically uh, gets in a lot of trouble. And again, that's going to relate to what we'll talk about with uh, conduct disorder from that. I want to say, you know, I think uh, some of these things sound difficult. I think a lot of our kids uh, weren't on the more extreme end, so don't want to present this the group as having severe conduct problems. And uh, you know, probably if if kids were real oppositional and defiant, they the parents would have difficulty getting them to participate in the study. So I think that uh, might have selected some of the more uh, challenging behaviors out. We also looked at the, the scale has competency measures, so there's a school comp competency score which will relate to fly ash, and it just asks about the child's performance in school. In school, or do they get special education services or school problems? Do they repeat a grade? <clears throat> and on the right is the ROC curve, just demonstrating how they identify validity in these scales. So, what's done is they they get a sample of Children, uh, one group is considered typical development, one's considered to have conduct disorder. And then looking at scores on the scale, they can determine uh, the sensitivity and specificity of the score for ident identifying conduct disorder. So, you know, sometimes there's questions, what's well, the parent rating scale? You know, does that really re reflect uh, child behavior problems? And so there's been a lot of research looking at these scales and how they might predict uh, a clinical diagnosis of a conduct disorder. So they do they do fairly well. And, and like, for example, the the uh, sensitivity is up near uh, 90 percent for the rule breaking behavior that we'll talk about. So the parents completed that. And in the home, we did uh, uh, neurobehavioral testing and we used the behavioral assessment 
uh, research system, the bars, and you can see uh, how it looks. There's a nine button keyboard that's connected to a laptop and there's a, a presentation to the child and different tasks are presented. And this was developed by Dan Rollman um, and it really developed specifically to look at neurotoxicity. Uh, it's used for children and adults. It's used across cultures. Um, so there's no real cultural bias into it. Language issues are addressed. So it's something that can be used widely used uh, for populations. And it's been used for looking at uh, metal exposure for pesticides uh, for farm workers and and you know exposure to pesticides in that setting. So it's got a lot of a lot of uh, use for uh, uh, looking at uh, neurobehavioral effects of, of uh, toxic exposures. And the tests measure um, specific skills. So there's a, a test called a continuous performance test that measures the ability to sustain attention, uh, looks at impulsivity, uh, how fast you can process speed and reaction time, your fine motor speed, how quickly you can tap your finger, associative learning, uh, you know, how, how well you can associate a number with a, a symbol, short-term memory. And these are all things that have been found to be sensitive to neurotoxic exposure. And in picking out these tests, uh, it, um, you know, one issue is looking at the exposure. So we, we were looking at exposure over the past year, acute exposures. So, you know, we wouldn't necessarily expect that the child would have lower IQ or, um, you know, problems of a, of, in terms of a, significant neurodevelopmental disorder just from that last year exposure. For example, autism. So in this group, we wouldn't expect them to be exposed for a year and then suddenly have autism. You know, that's thought to occur prenatally and exposures at that time are more important. So we're picking the test also based on what behaviors uh, or what, what the exposure is. And, and these are all uh, potential potentially affected by uh, environmental exposures. There'll also be an additional manual test that I did that that um, we'll talk about, and that's called the uh, BMI or the visual motor integration test. And uh, in the lower right there, you can see the, the child has to copy designs, uh, starts easy and gets to more difficult designs. And basically the child just sees the designs and then has to reproduce them. And again, that's that's been shown to be sensitive to uh, environmental exposures. Just the need to uh, visualize the image, hold it in your brain, and and uh, have your hands reproduce it. And I just wanted to point out the continuous performance test. So that's uh, kind of what that is. And again, spend a little bit more time on these neural behavioral measures since people may not be familiar with them. This is called a continuous performance test. It's commonly used for neurotoxicity, but also for uh, like assessing ADHD. We might use it for looking at uh, beneficial effects of ADHD stimulant medication. You can uh, see improvement in in uh, these tasks for kids that are responding to medication. So it's used quite a bit. And what happens um, is that the child is presented with these uh, figures on the uh, laptop, and then you have a button. You have to push a button. So you're given. You see, with the target is the red square there. So the child learns, does some practice and learns that you hit that button every time you see the red, red square. And then these non-targets that are presented like the red triangle, blue square, et cetera. And so the child has to inhibit responses to non-targets and just push the button for targets. And these are, are rapidly presented. Uh, they're shown for 100 milliseconds and you can vary that. The time between the, the uh, stimuli are varied, so you can't predict you know, when they're going to show up. And what we can do is, is measure how long it takes the child to respond to a target, you know, whether they miss a target, that's an omission error and problems with attention, and whether they're impulsive. So like if you see the yellow circle and you hit the button, uh, you push your button for the wrong target, that's a measure of impulsive responding. So it's a nice test that can show sustained attention, impulsivity, and processing speed. And, and those are, again, kind of core elements in assessing neurotoxicity. So um, we enrolled 269. Well, actually, I have data from 269. We enrolled more, like, I think it was 282. We didn't get full data on the, on the sample. Um, we had to end enrollment due to COVID. And uh, we were hoping to get 300, 300 uh, subjects with all data. And uh, with COVID, we had to end it and, and it felt like, you know, we didn't, it really wouldn't make sense to start again now because behaviors changed and the environment that you're in changed. So it felt like we kind of had to end the study, uh, but I, I don't think it impacted data too much. Um, 
And then uh, what we did after doing those tests that I just described, uh, I contacted parents who had uh, concerning child behavior noted on the behavior checklist and did a diagnostic interview confirming that these were behavior problems. And then um, we gave the information back to parents on was there fly ash in your home and also results of the uh, pixie analysis, the metals and the nails. And we sent the information to parents saying, you know, here's your findings and here's how it com compares to the, uh, the the total group. And um, and then and then gave recommendations for follow up and, and some issues. There were some kids we had lead and arsenic that were identified. And for those, we noted that you need to really go talk to your the child's physician about this, but really referred to medical providers or you know we could follow up. Um, they could call us and talk more, but uh, you know try to get parents follow up information on what to do about the exposures from there. But the group that we we uh, ended up with for most of the analysis, we had. 47% uh, uh, female, 52% male, as you can see, our age. We had an average age of 10, uh, for, range from 6 to 14. Um, Self-identified race, which was used uh, uh, because of health inequities and the potential effect on social determinants of health. Uh, we looked at race and we had 74% white and 25% identified as non-white. And we also looked at factors like such as maternal education, or caregiver education and high school or some college, 59% college degree or graduate school, 40%. So we had, a, I think we had a good mixture uh, of subjects representing a lot of demographics that are of interest. So um, what we wanted to do first was look at, uh, well, not necessarily first, but one issue was how does fly ash in the home uh, relate to um, to uh, conduct disorder and kind of the rationale for that was that um, a previous research, especially around lead, has has indicated concerns about increased th things like ADHD and conduct problems. So kind of made sense to, you know, as a metal, it's, it, it's helpful in terms of the heavy metals and in, 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 uh, in the fly ash, it made sense to look at that as an issue. And then we had a good measure of that from the child behavior checklist. And we found that um, in the home, um, 44% of families, as it mentioned, had fly ash, uh, had indoor fly ash, 43%, 117 out of the sample, 57% did not have uh, fly ash. So what we did was uh, compare the uh, so-called normal group, they're not necessarily normal, but non-conduct disorder with, with those that were identified with conduct disorder. And we had 40 that, that met criteria for conduct disorder from that uh, child behavior checklist. And with the, uh, we see sex, age, uh, race, education, uh, traffic exposure, and fly ash. You know, the, as you'll see, uh, sex, age, race, and mother's education didn't really have an impact on conduct disorder, but uh, fly ash and traffic exposure did. So when we looked at, um, this is a modified uh, Poisson re regression, uh, looking at prevalence risk. And this was our model that we put together just based on, you know, factors that could be related to conduct disorder. And again, we use age because there certainly is age effects and gender effects uh, are noted. And again, race related to social determinants of health and then um, uh, education. And, and it, these are not, um, you know, there's some controversy about how much these are related to conduct disorder, but there, we included them in the model. And then traffic exposure and the traffic exposure is from the environmental justice screen. Uh, and at the EPA website, and there's a traffic variable. And so what it does was uh, it, for a child's address, it gives information on how much traffic is in that area. And it's useful you know, for traffic related air pollution or other factors that could affect behavior. And when we put that in the model, um, you know, we found that fly ash in the, the uh, filter in increased the risk for conduct disorder you know, about 1.8 times, and which was significant. And when, so when controlling for these other factors, um, we see that fly ash, you know, does appear to increase the risk for, for conduct problems. And uh, there is some, uh, as part of the model, also traffic exposure was noted as a increased risk also, but you know, we were looking at the fly ash. And, you know, furthermore, with, with uh, homes with fly ash in it, we found that the kids were, were more likely to um, 
again, we adjusted for the same kind of variables. We also adjusted for mother's anxiety, which is a self-report measure, uh, because uh, you know, we try to control for things like um, mental health issues that can uh, be run in families. And uh, so we did, we controlled for that in this analysis. But what we found too is dep depressive problems. And uh, I always worry this is the, the relative risk is 1.79 and the same for conduct disorders. So. Um, you think, well, you must be fabricating the data if they're both 1.79, but uh, they, we did. And so there's an increased risk for depression, and the diagnostic criteria for depression is feelings of sadness, hope, hopelessness, uh, loss of interest, lack of pleasure, short temper, irritation, tiredness, memory loss, sleep problems, crying uncontrollably, re reduced appetite. So, th so these depressive problems are reflecting those kind of behaviors that are reported by parents uh, who have fly ash in the home. So the question then is, well, what, uh, you know, if the what's causing it, what in the fly ash might be causing it? So we started looking at the nails and um, what what metalloids or metals are in the nails. And here's a list of uh, metals that we've found. There's some other metals too. There we have uh, uh, some smaller frequency metals that are also uh, found. You know, one of the problems is. Um, for example, selenium, we only have, uh, these are with males, only 15 that were um, identified. So we, th they were below the limit of detection. So we're just we're just showing kids here where we had a, we had uh, detectable levels of metals or metalloids. And what we did was look at um, the, the, the press of problem scale and we there were sex effects. So I've separated it by sex. So for males, if we uh, look at the, um, chart here and it shows the the uh, these are parts per million concentrations of the metals uh, the median for those where we had detectable levels it shows you the interquartile range and uh, the p-value and uh, if you look at uh, copper uh, copper and zinc those were both significant in terms of uh, males with um, internalizing behaviors. And when I say internalizing behaviors, that means depression and anxiety. So those kind of depressive problems. And males were more likely to have higher levels of copper and zinc. And you know, if you look at the literature, copper and zinc would be something you kind of expect with, with uh, mental health issues, because copper, for example, or, um, there's syndromes like Wilson's disease that have uh, effects on copper metabolism and psychiatric issues. So it's not surprising that copper and zinc might be uh, link to it and copper and zinc are in on fly ash so that would be a potential uh, source you know and again we can't say that's where it's coming from or anything but we wanted to look at the metals and see what's related to these depressive problems in females it's a little bit different and um, zirconium was significant in the males uh, down at the bottom there and it was also significant in the females so our findings were that both males and females had increased risk of depressive problems uh, with zirconium and i have no idea what that means or uh, hopefully somebody can tell me why zirconium might be a bad thing um, but that was present in both males and females and, and females and males differed on the uh, copper and on the uh, zinc exposure and effects on behavior feel free to interrupt if anybody has questions i'd be glad to Clarify. So to further uh, follow up on looking at metals in the nails, so again, looking at um, manganese, and again, there's a rationale <clears throat> with manganese, there's, there's uh, quite a bit of research on uh, neurotoxicity, and as you know, it's an essential, an essential element, but at high levels, it can be neurotoxic, and uh, there's a disorder, man manganism, that uh, similar to Parkinsonism, where there's Parkinson-type motor symptoms and psychiatric disturbance. At lower levels, also you can also get motor disturbance and uh, problems with attention and cognition. So there's quite a bit of research suggesting that manganese would be something to look at. So in our sample, we had uh, 45 children that were above the level of detection with manganese excuse me, versus uh, 201 that did not. And again, I think this might be a, a limitation of 
pixie in terms of uh, the detectable level and but again it would kind of bias against us in terms of reducing power so uh, it uh, i think you know i think our study is robust with despite that problem and so what i did was <coughs> Um, put together the list of these are the neural behavioral tests that we used and what this does is look at manganese yes or no and um, uh, regression uh, looking at um, the uh, uh, different tests that we used and the most significant finding was that what I mentioned that uh, BMI test so the child has to copy uh, designs on a paper and then it's scored for quality and ability to, to copy that design. And it reflects like eye-hand coordination and it involves, uh, you know, as I said, it, it's not just a simple motor task. It involves a wide area of the brain in terms of visualizing the image and, and uh, uh, processing it and, and then the hand movements. And here we saw that, you know, for those that had manganese, they had a reduction in uh, the test score and it's a standard score with a mean of 100 and average is 90 to 110. So there's a reduction of five points in kids with manganese and that was a significant uh, reduction in in terms of uh, performance on that test. We also saw differences on the the bars and this that continuous performance tests that I mentioned you're looking at the scores from that the, the kids with uh, manganese had more difficulty uh, responding to the target they uh, omitted targets they didn't they didn't hit the button when they were supposed to and uh, um, had difficulty um, with deep prime which is what's a signal detection so they, they had more difficulty with sustained attention the ability to participate in that task and again that task uh, takes about 10 minutes so it's it's meant to be long enough that the child gets bored with it so it requires sustained attention and uh, you know for the kids that had manganese they had more difficulty in and correctly responding to those targets and uh, being able to complete that. So uh, you know, with that, it kind of confirms previous findings regarding manganese in the nails. Again, we don't know where the manganese is from. There's various sources of exposure for manganese. Uh, it's in the fly ash we know, and, and it could be a source of exposure and uh, could have uh, impacts on the, the child's functioning in school, you know, attention problems and motor coordination difficulties potentially. <clears throat> so this is some of Charlie's uh, geospatial analysis. So we want to just also show about, uh, or I just wanted to show too, uh, another way to look at it. And um, so those child behavior checklist uh, problem areas, we looked at the different areas and see if they clustered geographically. And uh, Charlie could describe him in a better detail about how this is done. But with the hotspot geospatial analysis, it looks at um, uh, where high levels of social problems are found. And you know, for uh, the social problem scale, uh, it can relate to a lot of difficulties. I mean, kids with autism would would do poorly on this, but it could also be you know more milder social problems as well. So it doesn't necessarily give you a diagnosis, but you know, where there's increased social problems, there's also would be increased risk for autism. And I'm not saying this is where kids have autism, but it's one way to kind of look at, you know, is this exposure increased risk for social problems and therefore it could be a factor in autism. So that was uh, kind of the rationale there. Uh, there. But this is our um, map of sites where we sampled um, behavior from. So these are the homes. And what Charlie has done is, is show the hot spots where there's a high level of, of uh, social problems that are found. And as you can see, they, they tend to cluster around the power plants. And you know, to me, it's just kind of an interesting finding that, that uh, there seems to be something you know, related to living close to the power plants, related to social problems in children. And, and uh, uh, there are the cold spots, you know, tend to be kids with better social skills, but it does raise concerns about about the vicinity to the power plants. So, uh, you know, that's a little sample or a little uh, some findings that have been published or are be under review. But from the findings we've, that we've looked at, it, it uh, looks like first that fly ash is present in about 44% of homes in the vicinity of coal ash storage sites, and uh, 
again, no, that's never been studied before, so it's kind of a new finding uh, in terms of, uh, of indoor exposure. Um, but again, you know, we didn't look at outdoor exposure, so that could certainly be a, a different issue. Uh, second thing, uh, proximity to a power plant may increase risk of indoor pollutants and child behavior concerns. And again, uh, through that geospatial analysis, looked at uh, PM10 was increased near power plants, and that also increased child behavior concerns. Uh, we, we found that uh, fly ash in the home may increase risk for conduct disorder, depression, and poor school performance in children. And again, uh, need to figure out more of that mechanism. And also that metals and metalloids may have neurotoxic effects, increasing risks for anxiety and depression, you know, kind of based on our copper, zinc, and zirconium findings, and uh, motor co coordination problems based on manganese and attention problems based on our manganese findings. So it kind of reaffirms the uh, potential neurotoxicity of, of metals. And then there were sex effects also. I didn't go into sex effects in uh, PM10, but we also found sex effects for ADHD um, in terms of PM10. So and we found it with the metals on that um, related to depression and then also uh, with PM10 and that that's been published. So those are some of the findings. Uh, I tried to keep limitations to a minimum, but um, first, you know, some limitations, exposures only assessed in the home for a one week period. Uh, so, you know, obviously the child's at school or, or other places and <clears throat> we don't know the exposures there. Um, and a lot of these behaviors develop over time. And so, you know, just the past year of exposure may not reflect the history. Uh, you know, one thing is, is that we looked at how long families have lived in the, the, the homes that they're in, and 93% have been in the uh, child's homes. The child's been in the same home since birth. So, um, you know, we sampled the behavior at different seasons and controlled for different seasons of the year or tried to control for differences throughout the year. but um, we hope we're able to uh, to look at exposures that are likely to occur long term. It's not likely it was just the past year and not before. So even though we only had a short period, there's a reason to believe there could be a history of that same kind of exposure for the child. <clears throat> and, you know, again, the biomarker that we use, the nails, just reflect the acute exposures. And, you know, I think they're could be some discussion about what's the best biomarker. Nails are nice because of easy to get and not uh, invasive, so we use nails. And then, uh, you know, with Pixie, uh, Pixie seemed to be a, a good choice because it was a sort of a shotgun approach looking at 72 elements. Um, so, and, and you know, we're not real clear what we're looking for because the study hasn't, like this hasn't been done before. So it seemed useful, but the, I think the limit of detection may have created some issues for our, our findings. And then the other fa factor is just that there's, we know there's multiple factors, there's genetic and and other uh, social factors, environmental, non, non exposure related environmental factors. So a lot of factors that, that impact child behavior and, and certainly these exposures aren't the only things that are driving behavior. So those are some limitations, but you know, they would tend to limit the power of our study and and uh, make it more difficult to find differences. So I think there's reasons to think that our findings are robust. Our next step, uh, so we want to we're we're working on. Uh, there's been a little delay in getting the metals from the filter. So we hope to connect uh, filter metals to uh, the nail exposure. So you know if the child has um, arsenic in the filter, do they have arsenic in the nails? You know, is there a relationship there? And uh, uh, we want to. We're currently analyzing other health uh, factors uh, from the the uh, health history. We're looking, also looking at home question, home cleaning questionnaires, and going to look at you know why uh, say only half of the sample had fly ash. You know, was there differences in cleaning that made the difference? And when we give feedback to parents, we did recommend cleaning, like having a a mat when you enter the home to wipe your feet and. Um, to use HEPA filters and it's, it's good to clean and so some <laughs> recommendations along that lines that might help reduce the fly ash but we really don't know what 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 helps with the fly ash uh, reduction in the home 
and then you know trying to consider the nice thing about pixie is the we still have the samples we still have 150 milligrams of nails so it doesn't destroy the samples so we can could do other means like we've been considering like icpms just to see if that enhances the power analysis of our work and improves on the level of detection and then also kind of continuing our, our funding for coal ash work and we have submitted some uh, R01s and and haven't been successful yet just in following up on on some of our findings that, but hope to kind of get that uh, funding to continue and one issue is with cane run uh, closing that they're on natural gas now and covered the coal ash storage site so uh, um, you know, that would, we probably we may need to find a different uh, uh, source of coal ash uh, to, to study. And again, that's a good thing and a positive thing. And hopefully uh, all of the coal ash storage sites uh, uh, become uh, more uh, friendly to the neighbors. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, the research teams noted and again, Chris Zero I'll just point her out. She's the PI. She got this going. Uh, She's, she was at Louisville, all, all of these people were at Louisville at one time, um, but uh, it was thanks to her, she's the one that, that got the study going, did the initial community work and led to the grant, and she's at UAB right now, and uh, I'm the site PI, but she's she's the PI for the grant, and uh, we hopefully will have another uh, continuing um, uh, renewal uh, year to, con to finish things up. And then at U of L, you can see the list, there's, um, uh, faculty and then students are also noted there that that participated and at Ohio State uh, we have that's where stats people are other than Charlie uh, Guy Brock and John Myers are at, are at Ohio State and Guy was at Louisville and uh, just to note the uh, over our time we got to know fingernails and toenails how long they take to grow and when we see a child we would always look at their fingernails and <laughs> kind of gauge how long this is going to take and so i wanted to point out the guinness hall of fame for longest fingernails and that would be an ideal subject for our study uh, uh, if we could use her nails to and those are real i take it I, i've been told they're real so those are the longest fingernails and something we, we got to, to learn about and uh, thanks for your time and i'm open the questions. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Sears. Sears. That was a really, was a really uh, great, great presentation. presentation. Um, so we can so open we can up the, the uh, virtual uh, floor for questions. questions. Um, you can either unmute uh, yourself or uh, type it in the chat. Thanks for the compliments for the talk. Yeah, uh, this is Mike Merchant. This, that was a really great talk. Really great talk. Is the Pixie a uh, platform that, uh, do you think there's enough volume of samples to push through that that would be a technique that we would want to have here? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know. I don't feel like I can comment. <laughs> Uh, do you know what the budget was for those analysis? How much uh, for an individual sample? Oh, I'd have to go. There may be somebody else on the call that knows that. Uh, but yeah, I don't have to look that. I, I'll get that to you. I have to look that up and, and see what the I know it's more than than ICPMS. Uh, and I want to say it's more like a couple hundred dollars, but I need to look it up per sample. So I believe it's a lot more expensive. What what made you decide on the metals that you did study? Did. Well, again, those were from the Pixie. Uh, you know, we, we had about 30 metals identified and metalloids. Um, and what we did was select for the ones that we studied, uh, like, for example, manganese, that was based on the literature and, and you know, history. Um, and then the, the other thing was just level of detection. We have some metals like, you know, arsenic that we only have a few kids and not enough to, to really study. So. So the level of detection was a big thing, as well as trying to figure out, uh, you know, what what would make sense in terms of, of specific uh, findings and follow up. Gotcha. Uh, Lonnie, it's Craig Barnes here. There's um, first off, great talk, as I said. Um, is there a um, difference in the level of detection between the Pixie and the IP uh, IPCMS? 
Um, and maybe I missed that. Yeah, there is, and I <laughs> I did know that at, at one time, but uh, ICPMS has a, a lot lower level of detection. If you go to the elemental analysis, uh, if you Google that, and go to their website, they they list the limit of detection for the ele the seventy two elements. And my, my understanding is that ICPMS has a much lower level of detection. I don't, I don't know that right offhand. Great. Uh, I'll have other questions, but I'll save those for the Nerd Rig interest group. Okay. Looks like Dr. Hong has a question. Or he has his hand up. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Lion. That, that was a great talk. Uh, I just was wondering, I don't know too much about cold ash, but uh, my understanding, uh, you know, th there must be some nasty, uh, you know, um, organic molecules also present in there, including, you know, polycyclic aromatic hy hydrocarbons and so on. So um, I know you have guys uh, looked at uh, heavy or metals uh, or other elements exclusively, but uh, I was wondering whether you've considered the possibility of um, exposure to those other organic compounds that um, that are present in uh, coal, that coal ash. Yeah, we haven't done anything to look at that. I, I think as a product of combustion, it, it does have PAH in it, um, and I, I, you know, I'm, I don't know uh, how it would fit in with coal ash. Uh, so I think it's it's definitely you know PAH has been shown to be related to child's behavior. It's definitely a concern. You know, there's one that traffic exposure variable. You know, there's one question: is that related to PAH and traffic pollution? So, uh, you know, so I think that's a something to look further. And I can't really speak intelligently about uh, coal ash and PAH, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's available or it's it's in that coal ash combustion. All right. Thank you. Do your questionnaires that you use, are they equally as applicable to adults with ADHD as children? They, they, it's, it's not the specific questionnaire, but yes, we have adult questionnaires for, for ADHD. Yeah. The, the one that I showed only goes up to 18, but there's also adult forms of, of those type of questionnaires. Very nice. Thank you. Lonnie, there was a comment in the chat here from Dr. Banerjee. Uh, great talk. I might have missed this, but how do you distinguish uh, whether there's a difference in zinc and copper between the two groups is exclusively from fly, fly ash or has some other dietary component as well? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we, you know, we can't make that leap that this is from the fly ash. It potentially could be, but you know, it, it really needs to be uh, looked into further where the source came from, and and so yeah, that is an issue. There's also an issue with, uh, you know, multiple metal exposures, and uh, you know, in the follow-up grant that we application we did, that was uh, we had to put in uh, metal mixture analyses and. So I think there's more complicated questions like that. You know, where do you know where's the exposure coming from? We can't prove it's from fly ash, or no, it is. And there's other sources. And how do the metals uh, mix together? And so, yeah, those are certainly issues needing to to be looked into. It looks like uh, Dr. States has his hand up for a, a question. Yeah. Hi, Lonnie. Great talk. Um, I love this project, <coughs> as you know. So uh, your focus on manganese struck me because you also saw a correlation with traffic exposure. Right. And when they took the lead out of gasoline, they started putting manganese derivatives in. Oh, yeah. So I wonder if you can check the correlation between the manganese levels and traffic exposure. Yeah. That would... might be the source of your manganese. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good to look into. And it's also, I, I, in reading, it's in the diet that studies looking at manganese also include diet because root crops and such can increase your manganese. And so there's a, a source in water, like uh, Charlestown, Indiana has a high level of manganese in the water. So a lot of sources of manganese, I believe. And Lonnie, just remind me, is the, is the manganese that gets into the brains mainly deposited in the uh, basal ganglia or is it sort of deposited all over? Um, I've forgotten those studies. Yeah, it is. Uh, the, 
the interest is in dopamine and and uh, you know the uh, basal ganglia frontal striatal pathways uh, which are involved in motor control and attention uh, and so it does really uh, fit with that uh, model that that's used in animal there's an animal model looking at manganese exposure that that looks at dopamine and and the basal ganglia frontal striatal so yeah, that, that's that's what I th that's why I'm interested in too because those are the areas of the brain that I'm the cerebellum, basal ganglia, frontal cortex pathway. Yeah, of course, uh, those are the areas that are also involved in autism as well, spectrum disorders. Right, and I think it's related to that neuromelanin that you know we've talked about before that uh, it's a chelator and and so there's metals uh, uh, are attracted to that area. Does anybody have any other questions? I don't see any new ones in the chat yet. Looks like it's still snowing out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think until really coming down, I think until about two or three o'clock or so. so. All right, thank you, Lonnie. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody in the NeuroRig group in about five minutes or so.